ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our Long Map training webinar. Um, I'm Mariah Norman, the Lung Map Project Manager and Protocol Coordinator. The purpose of this webinar is to provide an introduction to the new Lung Map Screening Protocol and S1900A substudy. Um, our team has been gearing up for the expansion of the Lung Map study, so we're very excited to have this opportunity today um, to share that with you. Um, the webinar can be used for training credit if you entered your CTEP institution ID in the registration form. Um, but don't worry, you can also send that to me or Stacy um, if you forgot to add your ID. And we can add that before we send it to CTSU for training credit. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to let you know that this will be recorded um, and posted to the SWOG website so that you can refer others to it and use for your reference. Okay, and then on the line from our study team, we have our Lung Map study chair, Dr. Valley Papa, our lead biostatistician, Dr. Mary Redman. For the S1900A substudy, we have our study chair, Dr. Jonathan Reese. And I don't believe I heard Dr. Paul Wheatley Price on, um, but he's he did, also the. Mm -hmm. He did also join. I think he should now be unmuted. Okay, great. And then additionally, we have one of our data coordinators, Louise Heileman. And from our partners at FNIH, we have Dr. Stacy Adam and Amreen Chowdhury. And from the SWOG Operations Office, we have Crystal Miwa and Sarah Rice. And we also have other members from our team on the line from the Operations Office, as well as Statistics and Data Management Center that can help answer questions. So today we'll start with an overview of the lung map impact and current status. We'll talk about the new study structure, the CIRB mandate, and how patients will be affected. And then we'll have a Q&A about what we've discussed so far. And then next we'll review the lung map screening protocol and S1900A substudy followed by another Q&A. Um, and then finally, we will briefly cover accrual enhancement efforts and have a general Q&A at the end. Um, and then I just wanted to mention, although we have Q&A during the webinar, we do encourage you to place your questions in the chat box for everyone throughout the presentations. Um, and our team will be able to address them as they come in. So if you see the chat box at the very top, you can click that. And then down below, you'll be able to enter your question. Um, and during the Q&As, we ask that you use the raise your hand feature um, in WebEx. Um, there's a little hand right next to your name. Um, and then we can unmute you. Um, and, and see how that works um, for your questions. You can also add your questions to the chat box. Okay, to start us off, Dr. Papa, um, our lung map study chair, will discuss lung map impact and current status. Thanks, Mariah. Can, can everybody hear? Am I unmuted? Yes. yes but it's just let me know. Okay, perfect. And welcome to all the attendees. I don't know how many we have today, but hopefully many. Um, briefly, I think I'm going to go over um, what LangMap has achieved in a summary, where we are standing today, and hopefully where we are going very, very soon. This is a critical inflection point for the clinical trial as a whole because we're expanding our eligibility criteria. And with that, we're also revamping several parts of the structure. So for historical reasons, I think it is important for us to go over the impact that the study had. So since June of 2014, we have activated 15 clinical trials with or under the Lung Master Protocol Blueprint. And we were the first to coin this term, at least to my knowledge, and subsequent to us coining the term, I think we have seen a number of other master protocols arise um, 
in diseases, not only cancer, but Alzheimer's disease and many, many other areas. And I think the idea is intuitive, but we were the first uh, group effort to actually realize this in a private-public partnership for lung cancer and in particular squamous lung cancer. So we have registered 1,800 patients overall at more um, than 650 sites, 50 publications and abstracts. Academically, the protocol has done well. We also have collected a, a truly remarkable biorepository of specimens that hopefully will generate new knowledge about squamous lung cancer. 1,900 specimens in a public bank, and we have identified in patients screened for this clinical trial through their tumor material alterations in 300 genes. The most important part, though, I think for all of us and the most gratifying part is helping patients um, and providing opportunities for people to achieve uh, responses and long-term um, survival benefit. And we had the um, pleasure to look at these patient testimonials during our SWOG meeting. I think some of these pictures are speaking louder than words. These are the patients surrounded by their teams and expressing in their own words how they feel about participating in the clinical trial. I, don't, I cannot advance slides, so thank you. Um, so where are we right now? So the original protocol called S1400, the screening protocol is still open as we are speaking, and the patients can be registered to S1400 until the new screening protocol is activated. We have enrolled, as I said, 1800, approximately 1838 patients as of November 29, and 1,118 patients were screened at progression. 720 were pre-screened prior to progression. Open and accruing, we have S1400F, which opened in October of 2017. And as you may know, I'm sure you all know since you're participating in the trial, this is a, a clinical trial with combination of uh, two immunotherapies for patients that have prior exposure to PD-1 therapy. And we have two groups, acquired resistance and primary resistance. And we have registered 46 patients overall, 24 and 22 respectively. S1400K opened in February of 2018. And we registered as of October 18th, 28 patients. It is temporarily closed um, as of October 18th to revise the protocol based on new safety information that has come to our attention. And the data is also maturing for interim analysis to see whether the study will proceed or not. S1400 Gen has 93 patient service and 22 physician principal investigator service. And the lung map screening protocol is currently at CTEP CIRB approval on hold. And we're pending the approval of the new study S1900A that you're going to hear a little more about. <clears throat> so this is a, a, an overview, and I'm going to explain what the little colors and boxes mean. So um, we have the overarching structure of S1400 in green, which was our original uh, protocol. And you can see that right above it in the blue part of the box, we have the new screening protocol that is emerging, lung map. Under the uh, old screening protocol, S1400, we have the studies that are appearing in solid colors. Uh, so as I mentioned, there's 1400K that is temporarily closed. And then in the non-match category, S1400F that is currently open and enrolling patients. 
We are anticipating that we will have three studies activating in subsequent steps as part of the new protocol. S1900A is anticipated in early 2019 with Hukaparib, and you will hear more about it in a few minutes. And then we anticipate later on in the year, and I'm very excited to open two new genomically um, driven sub-studies, uh, one for red fusion positive um, adenocarcinoma with LOXO-292, and one for patients whose tumors harbor an SDK11 deficiency or LKB1 deficiency with combination of talazoparib and avelumab. In the non-match sub-studies category, we anticipate early in 2019 that we will activate a study for patients that have prior exposure to checkpoint inhibitor and have become refractory with combination of pembrolizumab and ramucirumab um, randomized against a standard of care chemotherapy, and you can see the options appearing. I think that's my part. Is that correct, Mariah? That's right. That's right. Thank you, Dr. Papa. Thank you. Um, before we get into the details of the new studies, we'll have an overview of the new study structure and CIRB mandate. Um, but first, good news. Um, we are happy to announce that as of yesterday, we were granted a pre-activation release of LungMAP, the new screening protocol, and S1900A. So um, we have worked with our site coordinators committee to plan how to roll out the lung map expansion. And we thought the best way to facilitate a seamless transition from the S1400 screening to the new screening protocol would be for a pre-activation release. So this means that sites are able to review the protocol documents and start local implementation before activation. Um, I do just want to note um, that the screening protocol lung map and S1900A are CIRB approved, but we are still pending final CTEP approval. Um, but we are getting very close, and we expect activation to occur right after the new year. Um, and you can find the protocol documents on CTSU um, on their website under protocols, and then you can search for lung map, one word, um, or S1900A, click the documents, and then they'll be under um, documents used for CIRB approval. Okay, so now we can talk about the study structure. Um, we are very excited that lung map is expanding to adapt to changes um, in the hold. therapeutic landscape and regulatory structure. Um, part of this expansion is to have a new screening protocol, which will be called simply lung map um, with no study number. Um, just as a note, lung map with a dash refers to the master protocol as a whole, whereas lung map with no dash is the study ID for the new screening protocol. Um, currently, lung map is CRB approved on hold, and once S1900A, the new sub-study is approved, we expect to receive full approval for the screening um, so that we can open the new screening and sub-study together. Um, the current S1400 screening protocol will close to accrual once the new screening is ready to activate. Um, and I do want to note that patients enrolled on S1400 will be able to participate um, in any currently accruing uh, sub-studies as well as future sub-studies if they meet eligibility. Um, and Luis will talk about this in a little bit. As you know, uh, lung map is an umbrella study that includes a screening protocol and clinical trial sub-studies under a single IND. Um, although sub-studies are included under the umbrella protocol, they are independently conducted and analyzed treatment studies. Um, this new study better reflects that standalone study structure um, where a revision to one sub-study will only affect that sub-study 
and a revision to the screening protocol should only affect the screening and not the subsidies. So um, once the new screening protocol activates, the S1400 number will be retired as a, as a study ID um, for new studies moving forward. And we have already see, received some questions um, if the S1900A subsidy is still part of lung map, and the answer is yes. Um, we have new naming conventions Thank with the lung map me. expansion um, where um, new biomarker-driven subsidies will have this study ID S1900, A, B, C, and so on. And then new non-match subsidies will be called S1800, A, B, C, et cetera. So to help keep track of uh, the various protocol versions, um, especially now that there will be the S1400, S1800, and 1900 series, um, we'll have additional version control protocols. So um, many of you will remember um, when we had the screening and sub-studies as one single document um, and know that the study, that the structure of lung map and the master protocol has taught us the difficulties of maintaining a single document. Um, so we thought that including everything in one document would be easier to conduct um, the study. However, with the setup, um, revisions were a large undertaking. Um, and if there was a revision made to one sub-study, we had to update all of the sub-studies. Um, sites had to open sub-studies even if there was only a small chance that a patient would be assigned. And overall, um, it was just challenging for all of us to manage. But we've learned a lot along the way. Um, last year, we created a version control protocol called S1400VCP that allowed us to start treating subsidies as standalone trials by separating the subsidy documents. So this is actually one of the reasons we developed the new screening protocol. Um, so now the study structure is officially set up so that subsidies are standalone trials within the CTEP and CIRB systems. So this allows us to more easily close out one series of the study if that's needed. And just as we did for the S1400 legacy subsidies, we will have a version control protocol for the S1800 and 1900 series. And this will allow us um, to more easily manage the regulatory aspects of the umbrella study. So here you can see what that will look like. Subsidies will be grouped under version control protocols, or VCPs, which are basically administrative protocols, um, just a few pages long with indexes that will list the current version date of each subsidy and a brief description of each revision. So we'll still have the S1400 VCP um, for the S1400 legacy sub-studies, um, but now we will have one for the S1900 biomarker-driven sub-studies and one for the S1800 non-match IO sub-studies. Um, so we really hope that um, these can be a resource for sites to keep an up-to-date record of protocol version dates. Another regulatory change with the expansion of lung map is that um, the use of the CIRB will be required for all sites that open the new screening protocol and its sub-studies. Um, NCI will be mandating that all U.S. sites participating in the NCTN and NCORP trials use the CIRB starting in March of next year. Um, so lung map will be following this policy starting with the new screening protocol. So as you can see here, uh, for sites that are not a member of the CIRB, registration of patients to new sub-studies such as S1900A um, are not allowed until they become a member of the CIRB. 
um, and sites should still use the IRB of record for any subsidies activated prior to the new screening protocol, such as S1400S. Um, so please note that treatment and follow-up data for previously enrolled patients will still be provided. And then if sites are already members of the CIRB, they can continue to use the CIRB as their IRB of record, and new patients may be registered once the study is implemented locally. Okay, and because sites will use the CIRB, um, they will be more able to quickly process and activate subsidies. Um, therefore, sites will not be required to open the subsidies of the new screening protocol lung map until a patient has been assigned to a subsidy. Um, so going forward, um, each signatory institution uh, must submit a separate new study specific worksheet or SSW um, for the lung map screening protocol S1900A and any new sub-study for the S1800 and 1900 series. So um, we had discussions with the CIRB and they asked if we could do a quick poll to get a visual um, for which of the following options sites might use. Um, so. You can see the two options here. Um, the first is that um, sites can choose to wait until a patient has been assigned to a sub-study before submitting their study-specific worksheet. Um, however, LungMap would need to be open at the site before you may participate in any sub-study. And then the second option is that sites can choose to complete the study-specific worksheet application as soon as a new sub-study activates. So given these two options, um, we'd like to take a quick poll and just see which option you think your site would likely use. Um, so if we can see if the hand raising function works here. Um, please use the raise your hand feature, which there should be a little hand next to your name. Um, if you think your site would likely use the first option here and wait to submit this sub-study specific worksheet until the patient has been assigned. And I'll give everyone a chance to raise their hand here if they want option one. Okay, and then you can unclick um, your hand, the hand icon there. And now you can raise your hand um, if your site would likely use the second option and submit the sub-study specific worksheet as soon as a new sub-study would activate. Okay, thank you everyone. Okay, this will give us a general idea of which option sites might use. 
Um, so it will be a, an adjustment at first for everyone, but we hope that all of these changes to the lung map structure will help sites process the regulatory aspects of the master protocol. Um, so please don't hesitate to contact us with questions as you start to process these changes. Um, there is also a slide at the end of this PowerPoint with all of our contact information. All right, um, we will have time for Q&A soon, um, but first I'd like to hand it over to Louise Heileman, uh, one of our excellent data coordinators, to discuss how these changes will affect your patients. Thanks, Mariah. Hi, everyone. My name's Louise. Um, we've probably emailed before. I'm just here to talk a little bit about the logistics of what will happen to patients that ha both that are already registered on S1400 and those that might be registered under the new lung map screening protocol. So to start with those patients that are registered on S1400, patients um, that have already been registered to, on S1400 or will be registered up until the time that we close this screening study will remain in S1400 and will not need to be re-registered under the new screening number. The S1400 protocol, including the data submission schedule, should continue to be followed for all of these patients. Thank you. Um, so all S1400 patients will have the option to go on to the existing sub-studies and any new sub-studies that we open under the 1800 and 1900 series numbers. This applies to patients who progress during pre-screening who might need a sub-study reassignment after being found ineligible for a previous assignment, or might need a new sub-study assignment after progressing on a current lung map sub-study. This, as, as for S1400 and as it has been so far, this sub-study assignment will depend on their biomarker profiling results, and it might also depend on factors such as prior treatment history and histology. But most importantly, once the patient is assigned to a substudy, the patient must be assessed against that substudy's eligibility criteria, which will include many more details. And at, um, if the patient is found to be ineligible at that point, that is when the substudy reassignment form can be used to look for another substudy for the patient. Again, this is just as, as the study has been operating in the past. There will be no change except that there will be more substudies available for your patients. Um, for those patients that have been registered under pre-screening prior to progression on current therapy in S1400, subsidy assignment will still occur upon the submission of the S1400 Notice of Progression Form in RAVE. The request for subsidy reassignment and the request for new subsidy assignment forms will continue to be available under the S1400 EDC in RAVE using the Add Event drop-down box. Um, as you're aware, the reassignment form is used for those patients who are found to not be eligible for their most recently assigned sub-study, whereas the request for new sub-study assignment is for those patients who progress on or after receiving treatment on a sub-study. The sub-study assignment, okay, so now we're moving on to lung map, the new screening protocol. So for new patients that will be registered under this new protocol, the subsidy assignment process is the same as it is in S1400 in regard to the logistics and timeline. There will still be two different groups of patients, those that are screened at progression on their current therapy and those that are pre-screened prior to progression on current therapy. Um, one change that will be discussed later on is that we, the new lung map protocol will only have a single consent for, those, for all patients, so there will not be separate consents for screening versus pre-screening. However, we still will ask for the status of the patient during the registration process, and whether they're screened at progression or pre-screened will, um, will continue to impact the timing of when they will receive the biomarker results and sub-study assignment. The turnaround times and form submissions will be pretty much identical to S1400, and all these details are laid out in the long map protocol. So this slide is um, basically saying that we, we haven't quite discussed all the details of lung map yet, but as you may have heard, it will be open to patients with all histo histologic types of non-small cell lung cancer and will no longer be restricted to squamous cell 
carcinoma. However, some sub-studies will continue to have histologic restrictions. For instance, all of the legacy S1400 sub-studies will continue to be squamous only. So patients that are registered to lung map um, with squamous cell carcinoma may be eligible for those legacy sub-studies that are, that are open to accrual, such as S1400F, and then they will also be eligible for any of the new sub-studies which allow squamous histology. And then for lung map patients with mixed squamous or non-squamous non-small cell lung cancer, uh, they will not be eligible for those legacy 1400 sub-studies, but they will be eligible for any of the new sub-studies. And some future sub-studies may have more restrictions regarding histology, um, or they might stratify enrollment based on histology-specific cohorts. So as always, it's important to read the um, eligibility criteria of each specific sub-study. We will also take into account histology when assigning patients to a sub-study. That is the end of my section, and I will be happy to take any questions now, or you can always email me at lungmapquestion at crab.org or s1400question at crab.org. Both email addresses will work. That's right. Thank you, Louise. Um, so now we'll open it up for questions about the study structure, CIRB mandate, and the effect on patients. Um, Stacey, you can provide um, additional instructions if needed, but I believe we can, um, you can raise your hand um, and we'll call on you or you can add your question to the chat box. Yes, and we already have a few questions that have come in via chat that I will attempt to relay now, and then we can, and then I will unmute people as we raise the hand. So um, we have one question, and again, this may have already been answered, but just to reiterate it. So if a site is already approved for S1400, they do not need to get CIRB approval to open S1900, S1800, et cetera, because those new sub-studies and the lung map screening protocol are all part of the same master, or do we have to re uh, approve for everything? Who do we want to be in charge of answering that question? This is Crystal Mew. I'll go ahead and answer that. So each individual sub-study is intended to be a standalone study. So each item will need to have a new IRB approval. So hence, that will be your submission of the SSW form. Thanks, Crystal. The next question um, is, will each of these trials have a full credit for each enrollment? Currently, the S1400 screening only gives uh, 0.25 credit. This is Crystal again. Um, I don't believe we actually have anybody on the phone that can answer that at this time, so we will definitely take that question and research it and get an answer back to you. Okay. Um, next question is from Tom. We have S1400 and subs open with our local IRB. Can we keep S1400 protocol with our local IRB, or do we need to transfer both S1400 and the subs to the central IRB? This is Crystal again. So with S1400, you can continue using your local IRB, but if you want to include any new registrations to LungMap or any of the new uh, protocol, sub-study protocols going forward, you will need to um, become a CIRB member for this trial. Okay. Um, and then we have a question, and this has been a question that's been asked a couple times. Will the slides be emailed to us um, to send to our project coordinators? Uh, I'll just go ahead and take a stab at that. We, um, I don't know if Mariah had intended to circulate the slides, but we are recording the webinar, and we will be posting that um, at to the very 
least to the SWOG site. There was also a question of if we could post this to CTSU for the non-SWOG participants, and I believe we will need to inquire with CTSU about that. Is that correct, Mariah? That's right, Stacey. Um, we're going to request CTSU if they can add a link um, to the SWOG website so that um, everyone is able to see the training and the webinar slides. And would we be amenable to distributing the slides um, in the short term for those who are unable to access the recording from the SWOG website? Yes, I believe we can send out an email blast with the slides. Wonderful. Uh, next question is from Nicole. Are you able to use tissue that was sent previously for screened patients to test for upcoming substudies, or will new specimens be required? So that depends on the biomarker. For biomarkers that are based on the Foundation One panel, we have the results and we update the results and send the site the notification if they're eligible for new sub-studies. For example, the LOH biomarker for S1900A, which you'll hear about. For, and, and Crystal or Mariah, correct me if I'm wrong, for sites, for studies that are using new biomarkers, that uh, new, new assays not using the Foundation panel, uh, I, I don't. What well, I don't know that we'll we'll have to decide that on a case by case basis and whether or not we'll allow patients to get retesting. Okay. The next question is from Evelyn. Can you tell us more about the single consent for all patients? This is Crystal. I believe we'll kind of discuss some of the actual lung map screening protocol in this next session. Okay, thanks. So, Evelyn, if you still have a question after that, we will come back to, to your question. Just put it back through the chat again and we'll, we'll re-ask. Um, the next question is from Annie. If we're not able to activate a sub-study at the time a patient is assigned logistical issues, et cetera, um, can the patient be assigned to a different sub-study if they are eligible for another sub-study? Yes, they would just need to submit the request for uh, sub-study reassignment. Okay, the next question is from Joan. Will we be able to use previous Foundation One reports for new patient registration? I assume this is uh, reports that have been generated from outside of the trial, and currently the answer is no. We need to participate on any lung map substudy. You need to have done testing within the lung map trial. That said, patients who have test results from the past we, were, we will try to use those to, to get those patients onto new sub-studies. We are pursuing the ability to include testing from outside of the trial, but that is not a feature that we are able to do at this moment. Okay, that's all the questions I have in the chat. I'm gonna kind of go scroll through and see who has their hand raised. I think the first person with their hand raised is Christina Wiseborn. I'm going to unmute you, and if you have a question, please feel free to ask. Okay, maybe not. The next person I have uh, is Grace Glace. I'm going to unmute you. If you have a question, go ahead and ask. Okay. Joan Arnesco, I see that you have your hand raised as well. I know you had put a question through the chat, but I'll unmute you just in case you have a second question. I think that was a mistake. Okay, no problem. All right. Thank you. Uh, I have another question through the chat. It said, did I miss the slide with contact info or has it not been posted? We haven't. We'll put up the contact info slide at the very end. 
So just bear with us as we get through. We've still got a couple more sections to go through. We've just uh, wanted to answer the first set of questions right now. Uh, the next person I have with their hand raised is Karen Schmidt. I will unmute you just in case you have a question. Karen, question? Okay, maybe not. The next person I have is Karen Smith who has their hand raised. I will unmute you just in case you have a question. Okay, no question. I think that does it for the questions that I've received thus far, either through hands raised or through the chat. Okay, thank you everyone for your questions. I do want to let you know that we will create an FAQ um, uh, worksheet um, which we can distribute with some of these questions as well as looking into some of the answers um, that we aren't able to give today. Um, so now we'll move on um, to learning more of the details of the lung map screening protocol, um, which will be presented by Crystal Miwa, our clinical trial project manager at SWOG Operations. Hello, everyone, and thanks for having me, Mariah. Um, next slide, please. So I've been asked to provide you an overview of the new lung map screening protocol and to let you know some of the differences you will see between um, S1400 and then the new lung map screening protocol. Overall, the protocol is basically just an upgrade from S1400. Um, we updated a lot of the sections to hopefully make it a little more clear and um, overall just provided the updated uh, language that we see within the protocol. Protocol. The biggest change that has already been discussed is the expansion to include all histological types of non-small cell lung cancer, including non-squamous, squamous, and mixed histologies. As part of LungMap's ability to adapt to the changing therapeutic landscape, the study is working toward establishing immunotherapy platforms. Um, the patient's pdl one status will be tested in parallel with the next-gen sequencing, and these results will be used in an upcoming substudy S1800A, looking at the combination of pembrolizumab and remesumab versus the standard of care. Um, and this will also, this will be included under the new S1800 series number. LUMAP has a single consent form for patients either in pre-screening prior to progression or screening um, because their last therapy failed. So I know that Elevant, Elevant, Elevant had a question in regards to this. Um, the only real difference in the consent is that it has been updated to the new NCI format. Otherwise, the language within there is is basically identical from what you saw on the last two S1400 consent forms. Um, it's just that in this one now, we do have sections stating that if a patient is being screened prior to progression, um, what that entails, and then also what it entails if a patient is screening um, after they have progressed. Um, the last item that I would like to touch on is the collection of the circulating tumor DNA sample, the CT DNA. This will be collected on a subset of patients. Um, the peripheral whole blood will be required for patients who need a fresh biopsy performed for this study. Uh, next slide, please. So by collecting the blood within about seven days, preferably the same day as the biopsy. The goal is to compare the CT DNA to the next-gen sequencing testing. Um, so we'll also be looking at the tumor mutation burden as well on these patients. Next slide, please. So sites will need to request kits from Foundation Medicine and allow for about three business days for them to arrive. Um, each kit will contain four tubes. 
The on-site processing is pretty minimal, as you can see here. Basically, just gently inverting it about 10 times and then placing it in the shipping kits that are provided. Um, as I mentioned, the ctDNA sample must be collected within about seven days of the tissue biopsy, preferably the same day. Um, the blood sample must be shipped out on the same day as collection. And because of this, the protocol has added a step zero, so sites can obtain a patient ID prior to the shipment. And this information is going to be included in section five of the protocol. Sites will utilize the SWOG specimen tracking system, and there will be a different lab number for the ctDNA sample versus the tissue sample. And um, this was basically a last-minute item that was included, so we will make sure to include this in a memorandum um, when we activate this study. Next slide, please. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Jonathan Reese and Dr. Paul Wheatley to provide you an overview of the new substudy S1900A. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Oh, great, great, awesome. Um, so thanks, everybody. I'm going to discuss uh, uh, our new study, uh, SWOG 1900A, and I'd like to thank Mariah, Crystal, uh, and everybody, and, and Paul, my co and everybody that's worked so hard on this to get this open uh, uh, rather quickly, uh, so we're very excited about it. Uh, so um, in terms of the study, this is SWOG 1900A, a, a phase two study of rucaparib in patients with genomic high uh, and or deleterious BRCA1 mutations uh, in stage four recurrent non-small cell lung cancer. And I'm going to talk a bit more in the further slides about the biomarkers that we're using to screen for this study. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, the study schema, uh, this, there's a, a lung map uh, screening pre-registration uh, and, and that's been discussed. And then uh, patients with either deleterious BRCA1-2 mutations and or LOH high uh, a score by foundation medicine assay will be assigned to 1900A. Uh, and there's two cohorts, cohort one, uh, which is squamous non-small cell lung cancer, and cohort two, uh, which is non-squamous non-small cell lung cancer. And patients will be treated uh, with uh, rucaparib, a PARP inhibitor until progression or intolerable toxicity. Accrual goal is 44 patients per cohort, um, and a goal of 10 or more responses per each histologic cohort. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so, uh, rucaparib is a potent small molecule uh, inhibitor of poly-ADP uh, ribose polymerase. It plays an important role in repairing DNA damage and maintaining uh, genomic stability. The, the FDA recently approved rucaparib as maintenance treatment for ovarian and primary peritoneal cancer following response to platinum-based chemotherapy. Uh, there's a foundation-focused complementary diagnostic test for BRCA mutations in LOH. Uh, that's been approved um, for uh, those tumor types. And we're seeking to study rucaparib in non-small cell lung cancer that are harboring these mutations or that are LOH high. And the primary objective is to evaluate the overall response rate associated with rucaparib in patients with these LOH high, loss of heterozygosity high, or deleterious BRCA1-2 mutations by histology. Uh, secondary endpoints to, to evaluate investigator assessed progression-free survival and overall survival, duration of response, as well as toxicity observed in this patient population. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, in terms of mechanism of action, as mentioned, this is a, a small molecule inhibitor of a poly-ADP ribose polymerase, uh, PARP1, 2, and 3, that play an important role in repairing DNA damage and maintaining genomic stability. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so rucaparib is administered orally. 600 milligrams twice a day with at least eight ounces of water with or without food. Each cycle is 21 days. Uh, some supportive care recommendations are to uh, use sunscreen uh, for exposed skin and f as photosensitivity has been observed. Every six weeks with a window, there's disease assessment. And of note, there are uh, some prohibitive medications that are BCRP substrates, uh, such as rosuvastatin, and that's outlined further 
uh, in the protocol, and that, those aren't allowed during a treatment study. Um, there's a drug interaction website on the FDA that we can go to that's, that's down at the bottom here for reference and is also included in the protocol. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so a little bit more about the biomarker. Uh, so the, the estimated prevalence for BRCA1, 2, and squamous and adenocarcinoma are, are listed below 5.8 and 2 percent respectively. And we, we selected the ones that we knew were most likely to be deleterious to enrich for patients that are most likely to respond. And LOH high, loss of heterozygosity high, is present in 16 percent in squamous, non-small cell lung cancer, and 9 percent of adenocarcinoma. Um, and that's been shown, LOH high has been shown to confer an overall survival benefit in retrospective analysis to platinum-based chemotherapy. So, you know, and, and it was approved uh, as a complementary uh, biomarker uh, for rucaparib in, in uh, LOH high ovarian fallopian tube and primary peritoneal carcinoma uh, based on improved PFS that was even observed in BRCA wild type patients with these tumors. So we, we, they picked a 16% cut point, we picked a 21% cut point to really enrich for those patients we think are most likely to benefit looking at these LOH high patients uh, as a phenotypic marker for homologous recombination deficiency in these cancers that may develop, benefit from PARP inhibition. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and, and just some sub-study specific eligibility criteria, and uh, you know, in addition to ones that are the common eligibility criteria for for SWOG 1900 and lung maps. So, deleterious BRCA1/2 mutations are LOH high, as determined by the Foundation One assay. Um, uh, the grade three uh, hypercholesterolemia or greater within 21, 28 days of uh, a sub-study registration and peripheral neuropathy grade one or less. Patients have to be able to take oral medications and no prior treatment with PARP inhibitors. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so the, the study is ready to launch. I think hopefully within the next uh, few weeks um, we'll be able to uh, enroll patients. And I'd, once again, I'd like to thank my co-PA, Dr. Wheatley Price, Crystal, Mariah, Stacy, everyone at SWOG, um, um, Roy Volley and, and David Gandera for all, for all their help with this study. So, so thank you, everybody. It's been a real team effort. And I'll end there and take any questions. Thank you, Dr. East. Um, so now we can open it up to questions about the lung map screening protocol as well as the S1900A substudy. So while we wait for individuals to raise their hand, um, I have a few questions that have already come in over the chat. So the first question is from Maria. Will different studies have different IRB numbers? So maybe this question um, was meant for Mariah and not Maria, um, and I oh, don't it was believe... From, it was from Maria, sorry. Okay. Um, maybe this question is in reference to NCT or NCT numbers. Um, I'm not really sure, but it would have a different NCT number listed on the protocol. They were, there would be different numbers. Okay, and just an update on the credit assignment. Um, there was a note from one of our SWOG members that um, we would expect that the credit assignment um, for this new design probably will not change. So just to go back to one of the questions from the earlier uh, Q&A session. Uh, the next question is from Mayumi. Um, can we re can we request starter supplies for the liquid biopsy kits? For the liquid biopsy kits, if you know that your patient is going to be getting a fresh biopsy performed for this trial, and you know that it's going to take three days to get the tissue and for you to schedule that biopsy, you should be able to go ahead and order those kits um, through the instructions that are in Section 15 of the protocol. 
but I would not order those kits until you have identified that the patient does indeed require a fresh biopsy for the trial. Okay, the next question is from Danielle. Um, and again, this is again on the CTDNA kits. Uh, can we order the kits in advance or do we have to have signed patient consent first? You would need to have signed consent from the patient first. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Tom. Uh, did I misunderstand? It sounds like the new lung map wants a biopsy and blood close together. We sometimes do not see the patient until three to four weeks or more after the biopsy. The protocol timeline has potential limit to, limit to accrual. Um, could we get some clarification? Correct. So the fresh biopsy is only going to be on, it's going to be on a limited amount of patients because for the trial, we really want archival tissue. But in the event where there's not enough archival tissue or the first NGS testing um, was inadequate, we do request or we do ask if the patient wants to consent to a, a fresh biopsy. So on average, um, I believe only about 10% of our patients end up with a fresh biopsy. And for this um, study to compare the uh, NGS testing to the results of the CT DNA, these samples need to be collected relatively close together. Um, so we would like them, and per our study chairs, would like these collected within seven days of that biopsy. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from Mayumi. Are the repeat CT every six weeks considered standard of care? I believe this is specific to the S1900A study that we were just talking about. This is Louise. I believe the answer is yes. Every six weeks, CT scans are considered standard of care per NCCN guidelines. Okay. One next one is from Sharon. Will new consent for lung map have all the side effects for all substudy investigational drugs? No, it will not. These are supposed to be standalone trials, so the screening study will only uh, consist of what the, sc the screening protocol indicates, which is verifying the patient population and making sure that the ha there is adequate tissue to be submitted for the NGS testing. So, and plus, we don't always know what substudies are going to be opening and closing. So, the, ri the risk information for each drug will be included in a substudy consent form. Okay. Uh, the next one is from Anthony. Can we submit specimens on Fridays? Yes, you can submit specimens on Fridays, and FMI accepts shipments on Saturdays. Wonderful. Uh, the next one is from our colleagues in Hawaii. Uh, we have an S1400 subsidy patient that progressed on treatment. He's currently receiving non-protocol treatment. Could he now be reassigned to one of the new substudies? This is Louise. Um, yes, if he, depending on eligibility, and if you have any questions about what form needs to be submitted to get that assignment, uh, please contact the SWOG Data Operations Center and we'll be happy to help you with that. Okay, that's all the questions I have currently via chat. I'm running through the um, list to see who has their hands up. Looks like our first hand up is Matthew B. I am going to unmute you, and if you still have a question, please feel free to ask. No questions. Thank you, ma'am. The next hand up I have is Mayumi. Uh, Mayumi, if you have another question, I'll go ahead and unmute you and you can let us know if you still have one. Oops. 
Okay. Um, the next hand up that I see is Pamela Nichols. I'm going to unmute you, and you can let us know what your question is if you still have one. Okay. The next hand up I see is Tammy Terry. I'm going to unmute you, and if you uh, still have a question, go ahead and ask. Okay, so I think the question was, you currently have the S1400 under your local IRB and another piece under the central IRB, and you would need separate IRB numbers in order to have these registered because you cannot have um, a portion under, under your local and a portion under the central at the same time. Did I capture that correctly? You were, your uh, audio is a little quiet. Crystal, do you want to tackle that, the, the not being able to combine local and central IRB into one, but the need for separate IRB numbers for these? And I apologize. I could not hear any of the comment. We do, I hope, have maybe some of the representation from the CIRB on the call, and maybe they could raise their hand and we can unmute them to help address this question. Okay, I can't see anyone raising their hand, and I can't see any of the names that I would recognize from our, um, our CIRB folks. So perhaps, Crystal, we can take this question offline and follow up um, in the FAQs that we're going to send out after. I agree. Thank you. Thanks, Tammy. Okay, I think that's the last of our questions for people with hands raised and via chat, at least at this time. All right, thanks, Stacey. Um, so we'll continue moving on. Um, the new and improved lung map is definitely no doubt in part thanks to our accrual enhancement committee um, who has helped us promote the lung map expansion, update our educational resources, and improve ways to communicate any study updates with sites. Um, our FNIH partners, Dr. Stacey Adam and Amreen Chaudhry from the Accrual Enhancement Committee um, will give you a brief overview of all of the accrual enhancement efforts. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Mariah. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hi, I'm the project manager for lung map here at FNIH, and like um, Mariah had introduced us, I work alongside Dr. Adam mainly on budgets and contracts for the trial and all existing and forthcoming sub-studies. I'm also part of the AEC team, the Cool Enhancement Committee, and I'll give you a quick update on where things are. Um, as, you know, as you may know, LungMap has this special AEC made up of members of all the four partners, and we work to 
develop materials that we believe will be helpful to the sites in terms of recruitment, enrollment, and study progress. And um, as mentioned earlier, the new screening protocol lung map and the new subsidy S900A will activate right after the new year. And essentially, the AC plans to push out the media launch on January 8th for the new lung map expansion. And this way, we don't have to worry about any materials getting lost during the holiday season. Um, this will also include the patient and investigator handouts, as, um, uh, as outlined in the, on the slide. Uh, the patient handouts will be located on the CTSU page and on lungmap.org, which is also being updated and will be finalized around the time of activation. The next slide shows other accrual enhancement efforts. Um, I mentioned that the lung map website, I mentioned the lung map website and the press release. Additionally, a newsletter will also be released at the time of activation informing all about the new lung map expansion. We also have an advocacy outreach call planned with one of our patient advocates who we were able to identify and consent through the patient advocate organizations that have been working with us since the beginning of lung map. And finally, the AC is also working on new strategies to use a social media platform like Twitter to share updates about lung map. And that's all the um, information from the AC team, and we believe this is all great news, and we hope that the information was helpful for you. And if you have any questions, please let us know, um, contact me or Stacy or any of the team here at Lung Map. Thank you, Amreen. Um, so now we can take on any um, general questions um, about the study overall. If there's any more questions. All right, we can get there's everyone. no question, but can I make a comment? Uh, sorry, Stacy, I interrupted you. Did you have something? I was to just going to say I have no chat questions at this time. So if anybody would like to send some, we can uh, have that done. Go ahead, Valley. Because of the recurring nature of the question regarding CIRB and local IRB, I think it may be good once we have answers to post them for people um, asking the question as guidance. Yes, we will um, definitely look more into that and have some discussions with CIRB and outline um, some answers in our FAQ document. Thank you. Mm Again, if anybody would like, would like to ask a question, please feel free to send it through the chat, or you can right-click next to your name and put up your hand, and I will unmute your, your line. Just let us know. Mariah, I still have no questions at this time. Okay, thanks, Stacey. Um, I guess we can go ahead and move on. Thank you, everyone, for your questions today. Um, as I said, we'll create an FAQ resource based on the webinar um, and any other questions that we've been receiving via email um, that should be available soon. We'll send out a memo when that is available. Um, and uh, here is our contact page. Please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, there are some new emails here for our new screening protocol um, and the S1900A substudy as well. 
And I just wanted to give a quick recognition to everyone on this call um, and everyone that's involved with Long Map. We have a pretty big team. Um, everyone's just very dedicated, and we thank you all for your feedback and support, especially from our sites, um, which has really helped us to expand and improve Long Map overall. And Mariah, before we do the final sign-off, um, we have had a couple of questions come in if you'd like to take those. Okay, sure, absolutely. Okay, the first one is from Nahit, and it's, uh, what training material should we provide to our study team? So um, the training for the new screening protocol in S1900A, um, this webinar will actually um, satisfy that if you entered your CTEP institution ID in the registration form, or you can also send that to me if you forgot. And we're going to send that to CTSU, and they have agreed um, that that would satisfy the um, study-specific training. Um, but we are also in the process of creating new training slides for the lung map screening protocol, including um, background and study logistics, as well as another um, training slide set for S1900A. And we will um, post a memo when those trainings become available on the SWOG and CTSU websites. Okay, and another question is, is there a timeline for patient to get to the sub-studies enrollment from being assigned from screening? This is Louise. There's no timeline between subsidy assignment and subsidy enrollment. The patient must simply meet all of the subsidy eligibility requirements at the time of subsidy registration. Okay, and that's all the questions except for they'd like us to put the contact page back up, but Mariah, I know you're going to get there because I, I broke you off halfway through your goodbye. <laughs> that's okay. Um, so if there's no further questions, I'll just go back to the contact slide here. Um, I also put my email in the chat box for any CTEP institution IDs um, that you can go ahead and send me. Um, if there's no further questions, just um, please feel free to email and reach out to us. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining and making the time in your busy schedules um, to join us today. Um, again, the slides and recording of the webinar will be available on the SWOG and CTSU website soon. We'll send out a memo when that is posted. Um, so please share them with your team members who were not able to make it today. Um, and be on the lookout for um, additional memos to stay posted about the activation dates for the lung map screening protocol and S1900A subsidies. Um, are there any last remarks from the study chairs or study team before we adjourn? No, thanks to everyone for a well organized webinar. All right, well, thank you everyone, and I wish you a great weekend. Thank Thanks you so much. Thanks, Mariah. Good weekend. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.